Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, guys. We're staying. We're starting now with the session. So, if everybody could, pl could please take a seat. I hate these like so far away. Oh, yeah, this table's. It's weird. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bruna, and I am one of the ISOC ambassadors, IGF ambassadors of this year's, and I am extremely happy to be facilitating this session on gender issues for women called Navigating Gender and Youth Challenges, telling stories about women, technology, and creation. The whole idea of this session is to promote an exchange between generations and, and to have like a really nice talk on how we perceive technologies and relate to it. So I'm having, I'm being, we are being joined by these amazing speakers around me. Um, we're starting with, um, I'll introduce them briefly and then we'll jump into the first part of the talk. So we are, we have with us like Bar Barbara Wenner. Uh, Barbara is VP for ICT policy at the U.S. Council for International Business. Um, we also have Purnima. Purnima is, is one of the Internet Society's 25 under 25 awardees. Um, we have Jackie Treiber, co-executive director of Viacom Wiki. Jennifer Chung, director of corporate, corporate knowledge for Dorejo organization. And Louise Marie, a researcher at Instituto Igarapé. So I'll start this talk by giving the floor to Barbara to <laughs> talk about um, some bridging generations and how we women enter the STEM technology field. Thank you. Thank you, Bruna. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. Um, it is just a pleasure to be here today, and I can tell right away that I am the oldest person in this room, if not at the IGF in general. But um, I hope to share some of the, my experiences with you, and hopefully that will be of benefit to you as you move on in your careers in ICT. Um, in addressing this topic, uh, quite frankly, I'd like to draw upon uh, some of the findings of a workshop that my organization did at the Internet Governance Forum uh, last year in uh, Guadalajara. Uh, on uh, bridging, bridging the gender digital divide. And I'd say the most important finding from that workshop is that there isn't one, as we say, silver bullet to um, bridging generations or bridging the gender divide, that um, addressing this challenge uh, requires a holistic approach. There is a role for government to play in terms of opening digital doors for you. There is a role of bit for business and other stakeholders to fill the gap and supplement or complement uh, what governments cannot do. And probably most important, there's a role for you. And I'll delve into this a little bit more when I talk more about my experience. And um, I would like to suggest that women and youth also are obliged to think creatively about how to leverage and use what you already have, both as a person and a professional, to become engaged in the digital ecosystem. So let's just talk first about what government can do. And I think um, fundamentally a government must provide a good basic education. This is foundational for any career or any um, activities you want to do in the digital ecosystem. Um, it can be um, just basic education. It can be something even as simple as electricity and good health services. You have to be healthy. You have to be connected in order to become digitally, uh, digitally active. Um, governments have a responsibility to follow up on policies aimed at ensuring equal rights for women. And in this respect, I think uh, another important finding from this workshop is, is one of the largest barriers to, to many women and youth in terms of entering the digital ecosystem has to do with culture. Uh, and that's where a government can't simply have on the books policies that ensure these rights. They have to actually follow up and see that, um, that um, that these laws have been able to transcend cultural mores. 
Uh, at the, I said at the outset, business and other stakeholders also have important roles. And in that respect, I have been very inspired by what I've observed among um, the U.S. Council for International Business, um, business members in the ICT sector, uh, the, the various initiatives they've undertaken, <coughs> excuse me, aimed at developing STEM skills, aimed at create, getting very young girls involved in, in the digital economy and coding. Um, going to the heart of my topic, though, I would say that business also is a keenly aware of the importance of enabling generational exchange change as a means of bringing more uh, youth and women into the digital ecosystem. I had the pleasure of helping organize uh, what we call um, an App Developers Day, or what you may know uh, as called a hackathon. Do, is that term familiar to everybody? I like to see a lot of nodding of heads. And we held this hackathon last year in June of 2016 at the OECD Digital Economy Ministerial in um, Cancun. And again, I was just so inspired. This attracted um, students from throughout Mexico, from throughout Latin America. Um, I would say the average age was anywhere between 18 and 20. And they brought their passion for coding. They brought their um, intellectual understanding of uh, computer science. And they applied it very creatively in addressing um, societal needs. So for example, uh, the, the hackathon was called Connected Communities, Connected Lives, and there were various categories of prizes that we awarded that addressed um, various uh, societal issues. So for example, uh, the, the team, and of course the, the um, students were divided into teams, the team that won uh, developed an application that enables a user to quickly and automatically provide all medical information to emergency response personnel when calling for an ambulance. And as was explained to me, um, in Mexico, there are a lot of, um, we call them crank calls in, in America, a lot of false calls where you call the ambulance and it's really a joke. But with this app, you would be able to send all that relevant medical information to the emergency responders. So when you call them and you say, my grandmother's having a heart attack, they would know immediately that you were telling the truth and they would send the ambulance right away. So um, this team won. They won $10,000, I might add. And I'm also delighted to say that at least half of the members of this team were women. So as I say, um, this was just a very inspiring example for me of how you can take your, in your understanding of uh, uh, computer science of coding and apply it to solving a real problem. But the important point from this hackathon story that I wanted to share with you is that it not only enabled the youth to demonstrate their technical expertise, but it also enabled, enabled a generational exchange of wisdom. One aspect of this hackathon was that, that each team got coaching from a very experienced uh, professional in the ICT field on how to pitch an application. Do you know that term? Basically, how to sell the application to a potential investor. So this requires an understanding of good communication skills and um, how, to, um, uh, how to present your in, um, innovation in a way that um, makes it a, an attractive financial investment for, for uh, an angel investor. Um, so that um, this in particular was uh, a, very, um, in, a very engaging element to the competition for the head of the U.S. government delegation who herself is a technologist. So I think th uh, that the youth gained insight from what some of the older generation could share with them about how you sell your product. And then the younger generation just taught all of us about what we need to know and what, we, what you can do, the extraordinary capability of technology to solve societal problems. Um, and then leading into this, I would say the final element of what I see is a holistic approach to bridging the generations, getting more women and youth involved, is, um, involves your role. And um, this is where I'd like to share my story about reinventing yourself. I think it requires you to look inside yourself and understand what your inherent talents are. If, there, if you have a, a, a capability and affinity for science and math, then it makes eminent sense for you to study coding for studying computer science. However, the important point I want to make from my story is that you do not have a technical background to enter the ICT field. If you have 
strong verbal skill, skills, strong communication skills, you can leverage those. For example, going back to this hackathon exercise, to pitch the invention, to use your communication skills to sell that application. The coder that you worked with may be a brilliant scientist, but he may not be able to express the brilliance of his invention. But because you are very verbally capable, you can sell it. So um, just going back to my story, um, I came, believe it or not, from a background that focused on Japan and Asia policy. For probably um, well over a, uh, a decade, I was with an organization called Japan Economic Institute. And I wrote, believe it or not, about Japanese politics and U.S.-Japan security relations. In the year 2000, the Japanese government that provided a lot, a lot of funding for my organization uh, cut off that funding. So I was out of a job. And that began my, my period, my, I'd say my five to seven years of, of reinvention. From there, I used my Japan background to join a trade association that had largely Japanese companies. So that was the Japan connection. But in joining this trade association, I learned about consensus building among businesses that have very different interests. And I basically, I learned about how to work with the corporate sector. Uh, from there, I had an opportunity to join um, uh, an organization devo devoted to public diplomacy called the East-West Center. Maybe some of you have heard of it. It's based in Hawaii, does a lot of educational exchange. Um, and uh, I worked with them primarily, again, leveraging the experience as a trade association executive. I represented that um, organization on Capitol Hill, where they got a lot of their funding from a State Department budget. Um, that organization uh, suffered a budget cut, too. What's it tell you? <laughs> I have bad luck, I guess. But um, that also pushed me forward in my, my reinvention. From there, I went on to use the conference planning skills I had developed at the East-West Center, use the trade association skills I had developed, and use some of my understanding of um, uh, Asia regional um, organizations to join the coalition of service industries. And that really opened the door for me to ICT. And um, so again, that's what, um, what I would say to you, that um, there is no barrier to your entering the ICT sector. But what you have to do is take a good look inside yourself and understand what your talents are, how you can leverage those talents. Um, but if somebody my age can do this sort of career intervention, you know, really the sky is the limit for you. Just take what you have been God-given and blessed with, take the experience that you've had, perhaps in internships, perhaps um, if you've had the, the uh, uh, pleasure and, and thrill of being in a hackathon, take all of that experience and know that it, you can use it to, to find your own way into the ICT sector. So why don't I leave it there and, and uh, defer to our other panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. Now we'll have, like, we'll have Jen joining us. Um, and the proposed question for Jennifer was, um, also on the barriers note, um, what barriers has, do we face, has she faced so far? And what, sh what she thinks should be done to empower and engage, engage young women regarding the use of ICTs? Thank you very much, Bruna, for that kind introduction. Can I be heard in the room? I always think I'm very far from the mic. Um, my name is Jennifer Chung. Um, I work for an organization called Dot Asia Organization. We are a um, registry. We are the registry for the top level domain, Dot Asia, and we oversee the policies that govern this particular registry. So um, I just want to start with a personal anecdote. Um, I did not enroll in any STEM class. I wasn't um, coming from a technology background, and yet I'm here sitting on this panel, this illustrious panel. Um, talking to you about this. Um, I, I'm actually from a law background, but um, I guess com growing up, I, there was a lot of uh, tr more traditional, the stereotyped uh, gender roles in my part of the world, which is Asia Pacific, where girls really weren't too um, encouraged to enroll in STEM or it wasn't um, seen to be something that girls would be you know, so interested in. And I think that is probably the very first thing I want to talk about is, um, Traditionally, it's been that way, but gender roles and gender norms and all this definition has been changing. We see it every day. It's changing. You see it in the news. It's changing. And um, a few years ago, 
actually maybe two years ago at ICANN Hyderabad, I was really, really encouraged to hear from a, a presenter, uh, uh, I forgot her name, but she is, was from India, and she told <coughs> us, um, the audience, that STEM education, the enrollment in girls have actually surpassed boys for the first time, and I was, I was astonished and very, very um, encouraged to hear this. Uh, I think Barbara also touched on this. What you really need in the very beginning really is, the first barrier is to actually have uh, girls, women, in, educated in this field, in STEM um, courses, to be able to then go into um, careers that would, you know, be in this industry, be in technology. Um, that's not always the case, as Barbara did say, and also for myself as well, but I think education is extremely, extremely important and extremely empowering. Um, the second barrier I really wanted to talk about is afterwards, what, what is there after education? You want to go into a career path, right? So career opportunities also, um, I think right now a lot of um, CEOs, a lot of technology companies, a lot of corporations do realize that, you know, we need to give women and girls more chances. It needs to be on the basis of when you're looking at a pool of candidates, you need to make sure you're, you're actually hiring from something that's completely diverse, gender-wise, orientation-wise, and um, racially also. But it's really important now to think about um, after you have this education, the career path you would then go into. And in our, in our ICT fields, in our technology fields, in, inter, in internet governance, um, traditionally as well, you, you see fewer women in these literature positions. And it's, um, it's a pity because when you look around now, you see that there, there could be more women role models in this area, which could then inspire young girls coming up saying, hey, I can do that too. I can be an astronaut or I can be a CEO of a tech company. Um, looking around, actually, I did a little thinking this morning, and I was like, who in our field right now can be considered, you know, these role models for these girls coming up? And you have, you know, ISOC CEO, Kathy Brown, she's great, and um, the UN MAG chair this time is a woman. She's also, also not from a government sector. She's actually from civil society, Lindsay Namor, she's a woman. And w another person I really want to bring up is Alyssa Cooper. I don't know if you have heard of this name, maybe it's the first time you're hearing of her, but she was the chair of the ICG, which was the IANA Stewardship Transition Coordination Group. So she was heading this coordination group that brought the uh, proposal to the US government to transfer the IANA Stewardship to the global multi-stakeholder community, and that is extremely important. And she's gone on to now chair the IETF, so she is a very prominent, very, um, storied career and she's very much a very young a very young woman as well so she is something um she's someone that little girls could be like hey you know if she can do it and she's i think she's extremely young I, I believe she's in her early 30s and she's done so much i can also do this too um talking a little bit more about what i do for um work for dot asia um we do a lot of capacity building programs <laughs> Um, one of our flagship initiatives is called NetMission.Asia, and we do recruit from the uh, tertiary institutions in Hong Kong. And this year, I was uh, blown away by the applications. We received over, um, over 150, and most of them actually came from women. When we had people come in to interview, we were like, we actually had to stop and think about we might actually have to try to make it look a little more balanced and have look at the male candidates again to see if we can <laughs> if we can actually make it a little more balanced. Otherwise, we'd have like 80% uh, um, 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 women and then 20% men, and and you know that's not a bad thing too. But we were like, this is actually a really good problem to have, and they're bright young students, and they come in and they're like, we're really interested. And one of the questions I asked one of the um, applicants was, you're, you're not actually studying in a technology field right now. You're, you're not doing computer science. You're not doing engineering. Why are you so interested in internet governance? And she said, the internet is for everyone. This is so empowering for girls to be able to go on and learn about everything else that, you know, she was telling me she came from a family of three brothers. I can learn on everything that they can learn on. 
and this has actually created a lot of opportunities for me and I want to bring this and bring my initiative forward. This is why I want to join this program and you know see if I can do local initiatives this way. And I thought this was really encouraging as well because I think maybe traditionally coming from Asia, girls weren't really encouraged so much to speak up and speak their mind and speak their opinion. I think the tide right now is changing. I think we need to take this opportunity to be able to express ourselves, especially in the ICT field. Um, another very important initiative that we support at .Asia is called TechWomen.Asia. And this was an initiative that was started in Afghanistan. So another um, country that is not traditionally known for being very accommodating to women's interests. Um, what TechWomen.Asia does is to, uh, first of all, uh, teach basic ICT skills to women and then give them opportunities to network and connect with other women entrepreneurs <coughs> in the region. And they can then start um, small and medium business enterprises together. And the pilot program for that was, I believe it was last year. Um, you can find out more from their um, booth upstairs in the IGF village, but they're expanding to South Asia, which is another region that's not traditionally known for women's rights and, and concerns. And they've gotten really good response, which is also something that I'm very pleased to, to talk about and pleased to, to tell you guys about. And the last um, initiative I wanted to tell you about is Ladyboss.Asia. So even the name sounds great, right? Lady Boss, Girl Boss, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, it's a movement that was founded by three women entrepreneurs in um, Singapore. And what they do is they do a lot of seminars, workshops, to encourage uh, women who are just starting out <coughs> in starting their own enterprises, own initiatives. I think for anybody thinking about starting their own business, there's uh, so many barriers already in that initial process. With the added dimension of being a woman, I think that could be very daunting. So this creates a really um, <coughs> expanded network of um, women entrepreneurs across Asia to be able to share their stories, share their um, best practices, and also, you know, any difficulties there would be, you know, kind of a network of support, which is really important, I think. Um, so I think I might just throw it back to Bruna for now. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, moving on, we will, uh, we see now Jackie, Jacqueline Triber. Um, and the proposed question for Jackie was, um, how do women engage with and in the internet in order to provide meaningful insights on the way we see, perceive our relation with the technology? So Jackie. Thank you, Bruna. Um, I'm gonna have to lean over a little bit here, so hopefully I'm not blocking the camera. Um, so I took this question and I decided that the best way that women could potentially engage in, in tech uh, in a meaningful way is through um, our ability to build histories and narratives. Um, and that happens through representation. Um, and I decided that I was going to look at a, an analogous platform, um, much like the one that I work on. I'm with ICANN Wiki, which is a wiki that is essentially like the Wikipedia of internet governance. Um, so I went to Wikipedia and I, I wanted to know a little bit more about the, the gender parity between men and women and their editors. Um, and I found that they had actually completed a survey in 2011 on this, this difference. Um, and I think right now, or at the time of the survey, the, the number of female editors, those who were contributing and making edits to Wikipedia was anywhere between eight to 16%. Um, and I, I want to go ahead and just read a little bit from their survey um, where they, they talk a little bit more about why that may be. Um, they go ahead and say, we can attract women editors partly by introducing tools and features that make editing simple for everyone, though especially for women, since our women editors are less likely to code and program. We have also seen great successes in the participation of women via our Wikipedia and the classroom initi initiatives. These efforts that are expanding around the world tend to bring in a in more representat representative proportion of men and women contributors. Um, so while I think it's an admirable that uh, Wikipedia or MediaWiki, the foundation that supports Wikipedia, uh, puts this information front and center, I found that um, the, 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 the above par the paragraph that I just read was actually coded with a lot of uh, interesting, slightly sexist language. 
Um, I thought that, um, so the assumption is that women aren't attracted to Wikipedia because there's a technological barrier. They're not coders, they're not programmers. Um, but yet earlier in their survey, they described the, the sort of changing demographic of their male, male editors. And they described this person as in his early 30s, computer savvy, but not necessarily a programmer. So on the one hand, the organization speculates that not having an, a progr any programming experience as a male editor is not a barrier for him when getting his work done. Yet the same logic or reasoning does not apply to women. Indeed, uh, programming inexperience is the uh, specific reason Wikipedia assumes women are not editing in higher numbers. So I just thought, yes, they're, 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 they're <coughs> trying to be solutions oriented, but in the way they're describing why women aren't editing, it's, it's almost a little <coughs> pandering and a little sexist. So um, I then went on to ask, how, how does this change? How, to, to, how does editorship and representation of uh, articles in themselves change on Wikipedia. Uh, and so I, I looked and I found that in 2013, about four friends got together, uh, it, basically out of the, the, the ruins of the survey, um, and built something called Art and Feminism. Uh, and they went ahead and took that uh, to build uh, editathons, which is something that at ICANN Wiki we also do, which is where we gather people together to concentrate on a specific topic um, and teach people how to contribute to the greater knowledge that is, you know, internet governance. And in, in this case, it's uh, female creators over time and current. Um, because that's something they realize is, is not only were we missing female editors, we are missing content on, on women who are creating, artists, um, et cetera. So they centralized their space in, in the MoMA in New York. Um, they developed the, the Edit-a-thon. And they basically got together a, a group of women from a variety of backgrounds to learn how to edit Wikipedia. Um, and in their words, they were challenging one of the ways women are silenced, which is through the preservation of information. Our inability to, to, be, uh, to participate in the preservation of our information is effectively a way to silence us. Uh, so since 2014, the Art and Feminism Organization has held over 500 events worldwide in 175 locations. Um, an estimated uh, 2,500 participants joined forces to create 2,000 new articles on, on female creators and artists. These were for cisgendered and transgender uh, female artists throughout history. Um, so I, I went ahead and chose uh, you know, MediaWiki and Wikipedia because it is effectively the same platform that my work functions on. Um, and we chronicle the inner workings of the, you know, internet governance. Um, so our project started in 20, or, uh, 2005 uh, to sort of illuminate the third wave of new TLDs that were occurring within ICANN and the application processes that, that happened with that. Um, we contain about 6,000 articles, over half of which are articles on the various individuals who have volunteered or worked within our shared spaces. Um, so for better or worse, there's no way for us to determine our editor demographics um, without voluntary description on behalf of the, the editor. Um, so unfortunately, when you create an account, you don't designate your gender, um, for, like I said, for better or worse. Um, second to that, our gender designations within the articles are also voluntary. Uh, but prior to this conference, I kind of spent some time going through our pages and by sight alone, which is some, sometimes problematic, I went ahead and, and gendered some people just to get an idea of what our gender demographics are on our site. And out of the 3,500 uh, person articles, I got about 10% in before I realized um, that we definitely have more men on our site than we do women. Um, and that's a problem I would like to rectify um, in my work with ICANN Wiki because Look at this room where, you know, there, there are a lot of women here who are doing really amazing work, including everyone on this panel. And I really want to make sure that the work that I'm doing, the site that I, like, help to manage, is representative of the space that we are in. Uh, so while my research or my work is not necessarily scientifically rigorous, um, I do think that, um, you know, we're working towards building a, a better, you know, better, better gender equity on our site. And some of the ways that we're doing that is through, sorry, 
is through a, a few things. Uh, one of them is that we prepare some material before each ICANN conference and within our quick guides, which is a, a short magazine, uh, we've tr chosen to feature, uh, I guess, mothers of the internet in each region that we're in. Um, we noticed that a lot of the language around, you know, the invention of the internet calls people fathers of the internet. There are a lot of, there's a lot of talk of the fathers of the internet, but there's not really a lot of talk about the women who, who really like drove forward the internet in the early stages. So in this article, we focus on the women who historically have been involved and who are currently getting involved, including the next generation of, of female uh, innovators. And then second to that, um, I guess second to that, I'm actually gonna put out a call to action, which is that um, I really hope that everyone in, in this room is inspired to maybe look around them and either look at them, their own work or the work of their peers, and maybe go to ICANN Wiki, and create an account, and start writing about the women that you know that are doing this work. Um, because, you know, if you look around you, you're surrounded by solidarity, and um, I really do hope that you, you, you wish to contribute to our project. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie. Moving on now to Louise. Louise will talk about um, the gender digital divide. And the question we proposed to her was, why is the gender, di gender digital divide still so, it's still so pronounced, even though all stakeholders know that it exists? Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Bruna. Uh, it's a real honor um, to be here. It's a real honor to be in such a great panel, to be sharing this, uh, this table with uh, amazing women. And I'd just like to, to share a bit of the story of how do we got here, how we, how we set up this, uh, this, this amazing talk. And I think we should look at it as a conversation, which I think uh, is something that we, we envisioned pretty much uh, when we were setting up this panel. And it all started out uh, in the BPF gender uh, last year. Um, we were participating, um, especially a lot of women from the youth observatory. And it was kind of interesting because I, I myself was there and we were discussing uh, the barriers to access, the, g the g gender divide. And what happened is at a certain moment I questioned myself, okay, so this is pretty much very interesting. Uh, the questions are really good, but what are, are we talking about age here also? Are we having, um, are we considering the particular uh, issues that affect young women in different regions? And through that question, we started out opening the Pandora's box in the good sense and, and exploring the, the complexities that, that we envision and that we see when we go deeper into um, into uh, this age barrier. And, and what's interesting is that what happened last year, we started mapping different initiatives uh, related to, to um, how to promote access to women and women in technology over at the BPF. And, and ourselves over at the Youth Observatory also started to go deeper and try to map initiatives in Latin America more specifically uh, that would include young women in tech. And that was a good exercise uh, to try to do that because we found out that it was, it was pretty hard to get in touch with them, uh, either because they were so, uh, they were starting out or, or, or because um, they were still in the structuring phase. Uh, and, and I think that is not bad. That is good because we're starting to think about these things and we're starting to take action in different levels. So uh, in this sense, uh, it was really good to have this experience. So how do we get here to, to organizing this panel, right? And, and right afterwards, we, we decided we have to say something about this. We had to say about, we have something to say about young women in Latin America and, and, and the challenges that we face and, and we're not coherent. We're not, uh, we don't have the same experiences in different countries and we have to voice that in some way. So, so we got to the Young uh, Latin American Women Declaration, 
uh, enabling, enabling access to empower young women to build a feminist internet governance. And, and this document, although, although it's like a very interesting uh, thing for us to like voice our concerns, to voice the narratives, and we, un we, we made it anonymous uh, because we wanted to bring narratives, and that's the idea of this panel, to not have a barrier between the women that are here and, 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 and everyone that has such an amazing experience over there. I think this is just a, 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 a very nuanced barrier that, that doesn't exist. And the idea over here is actually for us to share our experiences and, and to voice our narratives. And I think that's really important because sometimes we're very held to statistics. And this, this is really important. But to just share our personal experiences, I think there's a, a very uh, intrinsic value for us to bring that us bring that about because sometimes we admire a certain woman that is in a, a leadership position or we admire our peers and, and we just don't know how they got there we don't know how how, how they struggled through that through that either professional life either uh, a personal life either in their families and and we don't get to hear those stories and I think the real battle I think the real challenges come when we voice these personal Narrows, and we shouldn't be afraid of that, you know? And I think we're here today to do exactly that. And from my perspective, um, as I said, this is just the first step. I'd say it's a very, very small step, but it's a step that we're taking. And, and this, past, this, this panel is supposed to be a living narrative. Um, we don't want to think about the obvious relationships of tech and women, even though that's really important and we don't want to discredit that. But we want to delve deeper and understand the people, understand the stories, understand the complexities. And I myself, I, 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 I come from academia and uh, I, I study cybersecurity um, and I started out pretty much liking cybersecurity because of intelligence studies and defense. Uh, and strategic studies. I come from an international relations background. Also, not I don't come from a, a tech background, uh, which is which is interesting. Also, to see like this intersection, it's not an obvious path. So each of us are here. Uh, we come from different backgrounds, and and that's the beauty of it. Um, and in cybersecurity, is pretty much uh, very um, male dominated, uh, as security areas normally are. But I stopped to think about who are my greatest references, as, as Jen was pointing out, and I also started to think about what are my greatest references in cybersecurity and, I, I, and in internet governance, and they're mostly women. Uh, very knowledgeable, very uh, incredible women that I, I, kn I don't know their stories, but I know that they probably face very, to be in, in the place that they are today and to have, uh, get gotten to a place where they can actually have some kind of projection in academia, in policy spaces. They had to pass through very difficult situations as I think most of us ha have uh, very difficult uh, and challenging situations in our career path. And, and I myself, um, I, I, I got really happy in thinking about this even though the challenges are real. And, um, and coming from cybersecurity and academia, I, 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 my class in, I'm a master's student over at LSE in uh, data, Media and Communications Data and Society. And over there, most of my peers are women uh, working, either coming from a tech background, they're hardcore technologists, and, and that's amazing. And also, on the other hand, uh, I work, I coordinate a project on uh, cybersecurity and digital liberties at a think tank over in Brazil, Igarape Institute. And the institute is not focused on cyber. Uh, it's, it's more of like peace building. Uh, it focuses on social justice. So there's a, a whole different stem of, of, of areas that they treat. And 80%, 80% of the think tank is composed by women. We even joke between ourselves like, oh, we have the token males. We, it's, it's, it's funny, but, but, uh, but it's nice to see that, you know, that ahead of the, the cyber security team, there's me, there's another colleague of mine, which is a woman also, and, and we're ahead of this, uh, this project. And, and well, I, I think that's, that's the main idea. I really wanted to talk about um, not necessarily reinforcing the, the gender divide, but just looking out there and, and from a personal perspective, just seeing the good things that are th out there. And the, and the role that we, that we went through to get here uh, doesn't matter from which country we come from. 
uh, doesn't matter from which uh, uh, social economic reality, we are striving um, to get into a place and into a moment where we can be heard and where we cannot be afraid from uh, from saying our journey and and voicing it. So, so I think um, even though it's very much subjective, and I think that's me uh, being very academic here, uh, but I think that that's uh, more or less what I wanted to share. Uh, just thinking about this as a conversation. I think that's, if I can say that in, in one sentence, I think that's the whole idea, the, the, the lack of, of a barrier here, just uh, us together talking about this. I think that's the, the real value of this panel. Thank you. Now to the part in which we are already empowered and discussing internet more actively. I'll give the floor to Purnima. Purnima was one of this year's um, uh, Internet Society's 2525 Awardees. She was awarded like with her project called Respect Girls on the Internet, and she'll give us more of her perspective on Sri Lanka's reality and the importance of um, co fighting violence against women online. Um, thank you, Bruna. So um, I will talk about uh, cyber safety and like why we should make internet a safe place for women in in a general context as also I'll give you some insight on what's happening in Sri Lanka. So I think that this we shouldn't talk about internet safety specifically because it should be a like default thing because internet is anywhere extension of the real world and we are talking about road safety at a young age so why aren't we talking about internet safety in like grade one or two? Like that's my opinion in the whole thing. And also um, the problem is generally like talking about me and like Asian context, like women and girls are not, like you said, um, not encouraged to express our opinions even in the real world. And then when we express this opinions online, which like gives us like a kind of a safe space and we like experience violence and these girls immediately shut down and they don't, feel like they could express themselves anywhere. And this, this is why actually it's important that we make internet a trusted place, especially for girls, that we can like include them, them in our conversations so that we have a lot of different perspectives. And also, um, I'll talk about the project I'm doing in Sri Lanka. It's called Respect Girls on Internet. This project uh, came from a group of people coming together because of their personal experiences with cyber violence and wanting to do something about it. So this is a, a community-based cyber harassment protection project. So we built communities around Sri Lanka that could help young girls who are facing cyber harassment. It's like um, there are legal and uh, ways to like take action against this, but. In countries like ours, it's really hard and expensive, especially to, for young girls to go through these legal barriers and get a, action against it. And also, most of the time, the person who's committing the crime or like harassing is also a teenager, which makes it very complicated. So this is why, through this project, we were trying to uh, promote an empathy-driven perspective for this issue and getting help through peers. Uh, when you are harassed with cyber harassment. Um, so uh, some findings we got through this project is the best way, like a good way to address this cyber safety issue, especially in women and making internet a safe place for women is through, through spreading um, empathy and also um, security awareness and cyber safety awareness at a young age, just like I said before, like we, we learn that road safety rules at really young age and now internet has become a huge part of our lives. So this should be included in curriculum especially so that before women and young girls go into the internet, they know what could happen and they could learn how to be safe online. And also we have a responsibility to make it a safe place so that we can get their opinions into our discussions and um, move everything forward, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so 
I'm actually looking, I don't have a lot of insight on this except that than the situation in Sri Lanka. So I would re I'm really looking forward to get your input in what we can do on making the internet a safe place for women. Bruna. Thank you very much, Pranima. So um, we are opening the floor for questions, for any questions that you guys want to do right now. Um, we'll, we're going to do a first round of questions and then move back to the to our <coughs> panelists and then do a second round. So we have already one up front and one back there, okay. Um, morning everyone. I don't know if it's still morning. Uh, my, my name is Brian from South Africa. Um, I've got, I think, a couple of statements, and most probably those statements are gonna generate some questions in it. So my first question is, what advice can one give uh, to a man on how you can involve um, ladies on whatever projects that we're doing back home. And also, what strategies are there that um, are introduced by women so that they can feel, because um, um, someone mentioned that one of the things that we've been doing is to understanding the complexities, uh, complexities and how people work. So as soon as you start talking about gender, uh, to someone of opposite sex, they're going to start protecting themselves. So what strategies are there that, uh, that can be introduced or that you're working on, on trying to make sure that uh, men, they don't become protective to whatever uh, proposed ideas are there to the, by, by the woman. And also, a lot of people that are drafting these polit policies are men, because you said uh, the industry is dominated by men. So how can you effectively address or contribute to decision making to make sure that um, uh, men are able to accommodate ladies in a lot of um, organizations such as internet governance and all that? Uh, thank you. Right here. I'm gonna take three right now and then to the next round. Okay. Hi, my name is Julia. Um, I would like to make a comment about Louise's um, speech because I identified myself very much because I'm very interested in cybersecurity and geopolitics also. But mainly in the IGF, I've been feeling very um, excluded from these like, rooms because they're all male-centered and they're also very like older people and they all have their and different um, step of their careers, of course. And I, I feel I feel it's very difficult for me to like, integrate and to navigate these um, areas, and I wanted to comment a little about that, if we could, please. Back. Um, yes, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, you said you were the oldest in the room. At age 70, I'm possibly the oldest in the room. And I do have a very long experience to draw from. Janice Richardson, I created Safer Internet Day, which many of you celebrate also. Um, I think that the first thing that I've discovered over a 60 or 50 year career in five different countries is that women tend to be less, um, have less solidarity with other women uh, than men do. We all talk about the old boys club and yet we don't talk about the young or just the women's club. So that's my first observation. Why is it that women don't support each other to the same extent? Secondly, I think that for some reason uh, women always step back when there's a dominant male in the room or several dominant males and it's been very very hard to make our voice heard and yet it's our voice that should be heard in the future of robotics of machine learning also of cyber security we know that mothers will have a greater influence on the career of their children than what the father will for example um, my third point is that women often have other priorities and they fear they lose their femininity if they really struggle for their rights 
And therefore, whereas a man will put forward an idea and he'll sell it and he'll be proud of it, women are much more tentative about putting forward their idea and they won't fight tooth and nail to defend it because they have families, because they have other people around them. So I'm happy to share my experience, but one last point, age. This is another really difficult thing for women because whereas we respect the man, 65, 70 working in the field, I went through a terrible period at age 65 where young people totally wanted to reject me. And of course, you overcome this and then you get the freedom to have a much greater role in society. But I think that that's another thing that women suffer from much more than men. So not so much a question, but I did want to share my experience as it is so important that women bring their viewpoint, which is much more about the emotional and the social intelligence in all of this. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for the questions and experiences shared. Just one, one really quick note. On this table, with the exception of Pornima, the four of us have related from ICANN. So we're all active in ICANN, which is like truly male dominated field and extremely competitive as well. So this is one of the reasons that I'm actually like over the moon with this panel. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> does anybody want to start with the questions? Okay. Oops, it went, came off again, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, in terms of, of uh, uh, women not supporting each other, um, I, I agree with you, and I, I, again, I, I go back to another experience I had. Um, it wasn't related to ICT, but it was in a, one of my earlier incarnations when I was working on a lot of international trade policy because of my focus on, on Asia and Japan. Uh, w just a bunch of, of professional women got together. We were all about the same age, and we formed Women in International Trade. And you know, it, we, it, we, became, we got it incorporated. Um, you know, we found, quite honestly, um, a female attorney who would do the, the incorporation and all the legalities for us um, free you know, on a gratis basis. But um, that was a wonderful um, opportunity for not only networking, but also building these leadership skills that you will need um, further on in life. Because at one point I was president of the organization and um, it was a time in my life when I'd not held any other leadership positions. So I learned all about the nuts and bolts of how you lead and manage a nonprofit. Um, similarly, within ICANN, um, I am uh, part of the executive committee of the business constituency. Again, very much a learning experience in how you deal with a v very competitive, you know, uh, organization, um, how you manage your relations with men. So I guess I would encourage you, A, a to, you know, think about, um, you know, if you have a group of professional women that are, uh, you all live together, you go to school together or something, maybe form your own group. And um, it would not only be an opportunity for you to uh, network and share experiences, but you know, if you can develop that group um, over the course of a couple of years, you, you know, you can make it into an entity that, um, you know, for example, would have you could um, uh, engage with, your, say, your local parliament. You know, it would give you um, a vehicle to engage with your local elected officials. Um, and um, I found that to be very, very useful. So I'll just stop there. <laughs> Does anybody else, please? Okay, now the mic is on. Um, 
So yeah, just quickly responding to your question, I don't think there's, I really don't think there's a clear answer to that. I don't think there's a, a silver, silver bullet, and and it's and it, it comes in different levels. Um, if you think about policy making, it's um, it's a it's a structure that is out there. Uh, but I think some of the initiatives is um, there should be space, and I think the sensitivity, have it being sensitive, that this is a real issue, and that. There should be space for women to, within companies, within uh, uh, their respective uh, organizations, to build their own groups and to just strive to to make their own space. I think that's that's something that is happening. So, um, so really, just commenting on your comment, and related to 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 your um, to your experience, I I myself, it's it's. It's that you know, like it's your first. It's your first IGF, so it's your first IGF. You know, uh, it is chaotic. It is. How can I play a role here? How can I be here? And and it gets sm it's smoother. It's not the word, but it gets less less chaotic as you go. Um, and well, this is my third IGF, so th this is I'm not no, I'm no veteran here, you know. I'm not no I'm no, uh, but <laughs> but I think um, it is um, it can be intimidating to be in a room where, especially this IGF, where you got a lot of uh, um, government representatives, you got companies here, um, more companies, more government representatives, and many men. But there's also great women also representing governments here in the area of cybersecurity. And they're also, I, I, I really admire some of them. And, and it can be challenging to, to answer the question, how can, I, how, can I, how can I be here? How can I be part of this such amazing conversation that they're having about cybersecurity and norms? And, and, and how can I be part of this? And I must say, just don't be afraid to get to these people and to talk to these people. It can be challenging. Sometimes you might get a wrong look and you might be judged and that's part of, that's a, a hard part, but that's part uh, of, of the experience. But just don't be afraid to reach out and to, to, to get your ideas flowing because sometimes you feel, well, maybe what I have to say is so obvious about, about this, this certain theme and actually it's not. So, so I, I've I've been there and I'm still there, I'm still there. Make it clear, and and that helped me a lot. Just be bold and and don't don't give up in in reaching out to these people. Be them from governments that can be more intimidating or from other organizations or private companies. Uh, just go and continue. Just don't let your passion. Uh, go away, which I think that is, that is really, that can be really tacky in some ways, but it is a real, a real important thing that, that I myself, it keeps driving me uh, forward, so yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Jennifer, for the record, Jennifer Chung. Um, Brian, is that right? <laughs> um, Brian from South Africa. I really enjoy your comment and your question, because every time I go into, um, a session or a workshop that is on gender or on, on, on women, I see very few men. And I see yeah. even fewer men raising a question and even fewer men raising a question saying, what can we do about it? Yeah. I think this is, that is the first step that is really important and imperative. Because language, you were saying language, what kind of language can we use to not uh, make the situation worse or not exacerbate a situation that's already bad? I think language itself is very political. There's a lot of nuance and meaning. When you think about it, I don't also don't have a silver bullet on, on, on what you should say, on the, on the terms you should say, on, on the words you should say, but I think to keep your mind open to learning about it, when you're speaking to a female colleague or your peers, if you use a certain term or a certain word or a certain phrase that you find, okay, maybe this is not exactly uh, 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 beneficial to the situation, be willing to adapt. I think you asking that question already indicates your willingness to do so, so I really commend you for that. Um, the second part of your question was, how do we change the status quo of having mostly men decide policies to do with women? I think 
not even in the ICT or, or, or internet governance field. You can see it all across in governments, in states. I'll just give you a little example from the U.S. because that's where I'm based right now. Um, politicians are making, you know, um, decisions on policies for the bodies of women and women themselves are not part of it. So this is, this is a very big concern. It's a global concern. It is happening. The only thing I could really say right now um, is to allow women to get to these positions is to then kind of nurture and kind of support them throughout from education, from picking what they want to do. I think um, uh, uh, you, you did mention that there is a lot of um, hesitance especially from girls in the Asia Pacific to choose these career paths because in their families there's no support. So it starts from that and then support throughout their academic career, which um, Louise did touch upon. And then afterwards in the employment field, I think I did pull up something that I thought was really interesting. It says that in India, even though that um, the women um, enrollment in STEM is so high, after 10 years of experience compared to 17% of men, 41% of women then leave that. So if you leave mid-career, mid you don't then get to the top. You don't get to the C-suite, so to say, the executive mm -hmm. suite where you're in the position to make these policy decisions, to make um, decisions that then impact the rest of the country, the rest of your corporation, the rest of your, your business. So um, this, they called it the double burden syndrome, and I do want to bring up one more point is, I guess for women, there's an additional concern. It has to do with age as well. Um, whether or not you choose to or you choose not to, women do have a concern when they decide to start a family or decide not to start a family. And I feel that burden is definitely placed solely and squarely on the shoulders of women, whether or not they decide to then, okay, well, I'm going to have to support my decision or, or the unit's decision to create a family, but then for men, it's not so much a big of concern. Like, they would not be like, okay, I'm going to drop my career or I'm going to come out of a very high-powered, high-demand, uh, a very time-consuming, very stressful environment to then provide more care and environment for my growing family. This is a choice that women, a lot of women have to face. Um, as a lot, I see a lot of young women in this room, I see a lot of women who've had experience as well. Um, I believe you did mention, you know, age does affect women a lot more, and this is one of the aspects, and it's a reality. I think for men, if you do want to support, you know, support the solidarity is you take into account the, the kind of decisions that um, your uh, women peers or your colleagues do have to face in their day-to-day -day lives, and this is not just the ICT field, it's across yeah. the board. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. Jackie? Um, I also wanted to answer Brian's question. Um, you asked about how to get women more involved in the projects that you're doing back home. Um, and I think if you're in any place to hire women, um, try and prioritize that if you can. Um, and then once they're there, um, try and pay attention, to, not necessarily to language, but how much space you take up and how, you, how and when you talk. Um, and when you are in a group of, a mixed group of genders, um, Make sure that you listen. Um, sometimes I find in, in groups of mixed gender that um, a man will direct his gaze to another man even though I'm clearly involved in the conversation and I'm effectively kind of uh, pushed out of the conversation. Um, so I think that's just the first thing that comes to mind is just listening and also trusting women's um, in intellect and skill um, and also being, being willing to ask them what, what they're good at and then playing that up and that's a good way to support women. Um, I also wanted to echo the woman in the back's um, assertion about women in age. Uh, we do tend to talk about youth a lot and the, the impacts of, of technology and internet governance on, on young women. Um, but we do have to remember that at, that is a, a very important aspect of a woman's life is that as she gets older, she effectively is erased and she's effectively made invisible. And um, it's, it's really, um, an unfortunate thing because we, as we get older, we clearly grow in our expertise and we have a lot to offer, yet um, we are perceived by the world to be kind of less useful. Um, I will say though that in internet governance, I have noticed a lot of older women who hold very powerful positions and, and when they speak in a room, I turn around and I, I listen. 
Um, that's not been the case in some of the other fields that I've, I've, I've worked in. Um, and then lastly, with regard to uh, solidarity and women supporting each other, I have seen a, a, a lot of that in my life. Um, but I'd also like to say that this panel was put together because of our connections to each other and we all know each other um, and hopefully we'll get to know each other after this panel. Um, but this was created out of a trust in each other's expertise and intelligence. Um, so there's a little bit of allyship there. I'll just end by saying that I've noticed there's a lack of uh, female to female mentorship. Um, and I've been in the internet governance field now for three years and I still feel like I don't have a, like a solid either older woman or a peer relationship that I'm getting either mentored by or I'm exchanging mentorship with her. So I would just say that if you see another woman who is struggling or who needs help, reach out to her and be there for her because we all need that. Thank you. We have a question here and I know there's like, oh, <laughs> great. <laughs> we have like 20 more minutes um, of session so I am going to take, uh, I guess, three more questions, and we also have one question for remote participation. Yeah, okay. Which <coughs> Angie is going to go first, and then, okay. Mm. And Kiremi Peter Tai uh, Tai Wu, in question in chat, chat online, and why we are advocating of gender equality in the ITC's world, uh, how do we ensure women participation despite their lack of interest? And should not we focus on how to make a better teach world for use? Let's go to this table, the ones, okay. Beyond, oh, yeah. Hello? No, up here in the front. You can go. I can start. Hi, everyone. I'm Esther from ISOC at IGF. Thank you all for your ama amazing stories. I'll keep my question short. Uh, I know women who work in STEM, young women, but most of them have the challenge of dealing with sexual harassment, uh, advances from older males in the workplace. So how do we deal with that? And during board meetings, there's a tendency not to listen to the women's opinion and take a more male opinion. Thank you. Question, please. Good morning. I'm Charlotte. I'm ISOC of IGA from Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, I work in some community in my country or tech community to help to to introduce the woman in use to te technology. But uh, I want to know what is the best strategy to create confidence in women to use internet, knowing the different constraints and different issues in Africa. One last question. You can go, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Noha and I'm an ISOC Youth IGF fellow from Egypt. And thank you for mentioning the female role, role models in the ICT. Uh, it's actually hard to find a female role model in the IT, ICT field in the Middle East. Uh, noting that we ha also have uh, uh, the percentage of women surpassing uh, men in the STEM studies, but not in leadership positions, as women tend to give up on their careers if they feel that uh, it will affect their personal lives. Noting that in the ICT field, uh, you, you don't need to have like an office-based job or working from yeah, nine to five. Yeah. So what are your recommendations regarding this? Okay. Thank you guys for the questions. I'm going to give the floor to our panelists and I'll ask you to be brief and also we should start with our closing remarks. So, Pranima, you wanna start? Hello, uh, so I will answer the, I'm going to talk about the question about interest and confidence both together. So um, in my experience with like working with teenage girls and also like in my perspective, I think um, the best way to improve their confidence and interest is to start at a young age because there's been research done on like girls and boys you, like choosing their toys. Like when they were really young, they don't really care if they get a doll or a car. But then as they get older, they like with the social mindset they're in, they are like taught to like 
like dolls and play house and then cars and there are there are people like there are girls and boys like who like don't like dolls and cars but then like my point is um the society is like shaping their minds to like certain things at a very young age so if we give them this technology engineering electronic like these experiences and then get them excited about these fields they might actually be interested in pursuing these fields in the future and also like talking about solidarity i think if we have more stories out there about women in technology uh because there's like you said like um even in i can wiki like there's there's not a mu much of profiles about women and there are so many people in the tech fields who are women but we don't know about them if we can get these stories out there in a interesting way like so we can uh, get more women into the fields and maybe like have a 50-50 in tech thank you um Does anybody want to go for next? Um, Barbara Jenner. We're having problems with the microphone, aren't we? Okay. <laughs> um, I guess it was Nola's question. Yeah, concerning um, uh, how do what do you think about uh, pursuing ICT work that is not office based? Um, you know, I think I certainly think that's a great way to develop experience. Um, and from, in fact, from what I understand, uh, I was in a panel um, uh, yesterday that um, where we had a, a, a scholar from Sri Lanka, and he, and she mentioned that this actually uh, serves a very important role in terms of getting the underemployed employed. So that um, I think this is a great way for you to develop hands-on skills. I think it's a great way for you to develop business acumen. You'll have to understand how to basically run your own business. It'll be your own small business, but uh, and there are all sorts of uh, online tools out there to help you understand, for example, how to set up a, a spreadsheet so you can um, track your expenses and, and so forth. Uh, so I would, uh, I would, if you have that opportunity presented to you, I think it's a great opportunity. And it gives you, again, it gives you that hands-on experience that you can talk about when, when perhaps you're invited to an interview for an office job. Um, yes, this is Jennifer. Um, for the record, I just wanted to also address Noel's question and also Esther's question. Maybe I'll start with yours first because what um, strategies are there to get women to be able to work in jobs that are not in an office environment? I know this is a big concern in MENA because there's a lot of restrictions or, or rules or social norms that do dictate how women can interact in certain social situations. Um, the good news is the internet is a great equalizer. You are able to work remote. In fact, personally, I work remote. I don't actually work in an office environment. I work around the clock with colleagues around the world because of this great invention, the internet. Mm -hmm. So I think that in itself will uh, enable and empower a lot of young women in MENA region, also in a lot of other uh, countries in, in Southeast Asia, which is uh, of the same uh, concern, that they would be able to, to do things they weren't able to do before. And I did hear about the STEM education being, the enrollment is in, for girls is higher than boys in the MENA region, which is great. Talking about role models, one, the first person that comes to mind from the MENA region, at least in the ICANN aspect, is the GAC chair. The new GAC chair is Manal Ismail. She is from Egypt, so there is, there is one um, um, lady who is leading uh, um, here in the internet governance uh, sector that you can definitely look up to, that, which is from your country. Um, so maybe I'll just leave it at that and, and briefly address um, Esther's question about sexual harassment. I don't know if you're aware right now, at least in the U.S., there is this Me Too movement where we women are encouraged to speak out. Sexual harassed women, people who have um, suffered certain, uh, uh, um, I guess, harassment, rape, any kind of that, have been encouraged to speak out. Traditionally, women have not done so because of fear of retaliation, fear of repercussions, fear of not being believed. Hopefully, this whole um, movement becomes a global movement where women and girls are not afraid to speak out, 
because they think that their careers would then suffer as a result, or if you know they do report something like this, the, the, the authorities won't believe them, or if they report something like this, the trauma of going through this again will, will make them hesitate. So, so I think I can only say I would encourage you to speak out, because if certain so-called media luminaries can be brought down by these women, proud, uh, very brave women coming out and telling their stories, then you can as well, you know, in, in your everyday life. If you do suffer this or if you do um, have the situation, please don't be afraid to come and speak out. And lastly, um, I guess I want to talk about support, the support, the support network. Women are really great connectors and communicators. I think we need to leverage this part of what intrinsically makes us this way to help each other out. So I think when you're in a situation where you're not really sure, reach out to your fellow network. I think every one of us has this network of friends around us who will be able to lift you up when you really need it. So please reach out to each other and, and help each other. Well, so just to wrap this up, I would like to start by thanking all these amazing panelists and to all of you to have like a room full of what, what 50, 60 people willing to discuss gender and experiences in this area. It's something that when me and Louise, we were writing this session, we didn't figure so far. So I would also like to thank um, Angie for being the online moderator and Sara, our rapporteur, and Veronica, which helped us a lot on writing this um, proposal. And well, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. I'm both sweating and like need water. I know. <laughs> like, how does that happen? <laughs> I know I'm it's so dry. It right? is. I feel like I'm being <laughs> slowly dehydrated into a chip. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know, just a salty chip. Like, just, <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I came here with this wool and I'm like here, you know. Yeah. And I'm I still feel empty. Dry. Yeah. Thank you, friends. It was amazing, friends. We should take a picture. Oh, yeah. What is going on? Is this? <laughs> no, I don't want to let you leave. No. Hi. I you came. I didn't know if you'd be here or not. That's awesome. Yeah. I know. I saw that you raised your hand.